Hi, I'm Brianna from Free Code Camp, and today we're going to talk about the basics of computer hardware. Computers are made up of four basic parts. The input, output, CPU, and memory. The input is what you're putting into the computer. Think about mouse, keyboard, microphone, any way you're getting data into the computer. The output is what you're watching on your monitor or listening to on your speakers. These can both be any format, like text, numbers, videos, images, what have you. It doesn't matter. The CPU stands for Central Processing Unit, and that's what we all think of when we think of a computer. It's what does the functions, it's what runs the software, it manipulates the data. The memory is where we store data and information. Now, the CPU has exclusive access to this memory. You can't get to the memory from the input or from the output without the use of the CPU. So, just to review, we've got four basic parts of a computer. The input, output, CPU, and memory. In addition to those four basic parts, we have three more things we're going to discuss today. The motherboard, expansion cards, and power supply. The motherboard is what connects everything. While the data is flying around over here trying to figure out where to go, the motherboard helps route it so it goes to the right place. Expansion cards are sound cards, video cards, that kind of thing that can really up your experience as a user. Power supply is, as it sounds, what gets power to the computer. It's usually the part of the computer that has that fan on it to keep it from overheating. So let's do a quick review. In addition to the four basic parts of input, output, central processing unit, and memory, we usually have a motherboard, expansion cards, and a power supply. we're going to talk about the different types of computers. The biggest type of computer we're going to talk about is a supercomputer, which maybe you've heard of. A supercomputer uses a whole bunch of CPUs and uses something called parallel processing. All of those CPUs work on the same problem at the same time. The next type we're going to talk about is a server. A server holds and accesses a bunch of data or programs. Our website, Free Code Camp, is hosted on a server which stores all that information. Next, let's talk about a workstation computer. Now, a workstation computer, just looking at it, might look similar to a personal computer, but it has a bunch more power and is way more expensive. Toy Story was built on workstation computers. Now, personal computers, by far the most common type of computers, Maybe you've heard, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, something like they're different, but really this Mac is still a, just a PC. It's a, it's a personal computer. It's still both a Mac and a PC. The last type of computer we're going to talk about is a microcontroller. Microcontroller, that's the type of tiny computer you might have in your car that has a really specialized task and is really good at that one small thing, but it's not like you could use it like a regular personal computer. So, just to review, five types of computers. Supercomputer, server, workstation, PC, and microcontroller. We're going to be talking a little bit more about the motherboard. Now, the motherboard we mentioned briefly, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail today. So, what makes a motherboard is the connection between the CPU and the memory. If there's no connection between the central processing unit and the memory, we can't call it a motherboard. But most motherboards do a lot more than that. Primarily, they have expansion slots and ports. Now, expansion slots are where you put anything that can increase the performance of the computer without putting more load on the CPU. For example, a graphics or a sound card would up your user experience by giving you better video or better sound quality, but it wouldn't slow down anything that the CPU had to do. A network interface card could also go in an expansion slot. This would help your computer connect with the network around it. We'll talk about networks a little bit more in videos coming up. Now, a PC card, which has really been turned mostly over to Express cards, are found primarily in laptops. Because of the size, Express card is better. It's just much smaller. In addition to expansion slots, motherboards have ports. Now, on your computer, I'm sure you know there's a place where you can plug in a USB cord, Firewire, SD card, Ethernet, even an audio plug-in so you can listen through headphones. Now, these are all considered ports. 
a place on the motherboard where you can connect the CPU to some outside source, either to get or give information. So just a quick review, the motherboard at its very minimum connects the CPU and the memory, but it also has expansion slots and ports. We're going to talk about the basics of software. We've already covered hardware, which are parts of the computer that you can actually see and feel with your hands. Software are the programs that run on the hardware. You can't pick up a piece of software. You can pick up a piece of hardware with the software downloaded onto it, but software is the code that is written and imprinted onto hardware. The two main types of software that we're going to talk about are the operating system, like Windows, Mac, or Linux. Those are the main three. You're not really going to get any more than that. Or applications. Now, everything that you think of as software probably falls into these two spaces, especially the applications. Applications cover everything from your web browser to games to things like Photoshop or your mail, how you edit documents. Every type of system application that is not an operating system is just a regular software application. The big takeaway from this video is that Hardware is what you can actually hold on to from a computer, but software consists of all the programs that you can run on that hardware. Now, binary code is a really, really basic, simple computer language where there's just ones and there's zeros. There's by, two things, ones and zeros. Ones meaning on, zeros meaning off. So think of like a light switch, which in some cases, in super old computers, there was an actual switch which was either on or off. One being on, zero being off. So, a bunch of ones and zeros, they can mean pretty much anything, but really they're mostly meant to be numbers and letters. We're going to go in a little bit on how you actually decode binary or translate a number to binary code, but really, as you guessed, you can usually just Google binary translator and have that figured out. The most important part of this is you understand the concept that even basic things like zeros and ones can translate into something really, really complex and is the basis for all of the computer languages and programs that exist today. We're going to start by labeling, starting backwards, how many numbers there are. This will be zero. One, two, three, four, five, six. Pretty straightforward so far. The next step that we're going to do is take 2 to the power of whatever place it is. So here it'll be 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, you get the picture. Alright, now that we've got the 2 to the given power figured out, all we got to do is fill in some blanks and we'll have our solution. 2 to the 0 is, you got it, 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the 2 is Four, and we've got 8, 16, 32, 64, and that just keeps going on and on. Next, what we're going to do is see, okay, which ones of these numbers do we keep? All right, so the next step, figure out which numbers do we keep? Do we just add all of these together? And if these were all ones, then yes, we would, but some of them are zeros. The zero is the same thing as like an off switch, one being on, zero being off. So we can go ahead and cross all of these out right here because they're, they're not going to really matter. We want to keep this one, this one, here and here because they have the corresponding ones, which means yes, it's on. We want to keep that number. Basically, from here on out, we're just going to add these four numbers together, getting us, we've got 72, 74, 75. So this number in binary means 75. We're going to be talking about data size. The smallest size of data you can possibly have is called a bit. Now that is, I wrote a 1 here, that's an example of a bit. It can really either only be a 1 or a 0. It really goes back to that binary that we were talking about. 1 meaning on, 0 meaning off. It can either be a 1 or a 0. That's a bit. Bigger than that, we've got a nibble, which is four bits. It's not very commonly used, but it's adorable. Um, bigger than that, we've got a byte. Now this is common, referring to something in a byte. It is eight bits put together. Now a lot of binary things are expressed with eight bits, like letters and symbols, and a lot of most numbers really can be expressed that way until you get to really big ones. So our most basic data sizes, we've got a bit and a byte, but as you can guess, it gets much bigger than that. 
All right, so after we get past the regular small bit and the first little bite, which is eight bits, we get bigger really fast. The next step up is a kilobyte, which is 1,024 bytes, which times eight is a whole lot more bits. After the kilobyte, we've got megabyte, which is 1,024 to the power of two, which is the same thing as 1,048,576 bytes. So since we're growing exponentially, that is a big, big increase. After megabyte, we've got gigabyte, also known as GB, which is 1,024 to the power of three, then TB, terabyte, 1,024 to the power of four, and PB, not peanut butter, it is petabyte, 1,024 to the power of five. Just to give you an idea of how big this number is, if you can't see it, I almost ran out of room writing this on my whiteboard. These are some pretty big numbers we're dealing with here. You probably recognize megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte from regular storage that you've dealt with before on your iPad, your iPod, your computer, anything like that. All right, just a quick review. Bit, tiny little, either one or zero. Byte, eight bits. Kilobyte, 1,024 bytes. After that, everything is an exponent off of 1,024, going from kilobyte to megabyte to gigabyte to terabyte all the way up to a petabyte. We're going to be talking about data speed. Data speed, unlike data size, is usually measured in bits per second, whereas size is measured in bytes. Big difference being bytes is eight times bigger than bits at the very smallest level. Once we start talking exponentially, that makes a really big difference. How we talk about speed kind of depends on what we're talking about. When we talk about the speed of like an audio download, we talk about kilobits per second. Kilobits, not kilobytes, totally different number. Say we're talking about an internet speed, like the speed that your internet service provider gives you. They usually measure that in megabits per second, so one million bits per second. The network speed is something we talk about in gigabits per second, so a billion bits per second. Biggest distinction here, bits versus bytes. Data speed is generally measured in bits. Data size is measured in bytes. Another thing we want to discuss, just because, say, you have an internet speed that says you get a certain amount of download, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to download that many bytes per, per second. That's just not going to happen. They're talking about bits. It's going to take you a little bit longer to do that since your data size is dealing with bytes. We're going to be talking about the very most basic level that computers can understand other languages, like JavaScript. The most basic thing, like we've already talked about, is a bit, up or down, one or zero. On top of that, we've got the byte, eight bits put together. All letters, numbers, and symbols can be broken down into bytes that the computer can understand at the most basic level. So that means all of the letters and symbols that you're using in your JavaScript can be translated into bytes. Now, there are a lot of languages that the computer uses at the most basic levels to run just the operating system. But what I want you to get away from this lesson is that everything in your computer boils down to binary bytes. We're going to be talking about data networks. You've heard of networks before, maybe a water network, a road network, even a television network or a cell phone network. Today, we're talking about data networks, which are the networks that computers use. The three types we're going to cover in this video are the local area network, the wide area network, and the virtual private network. A local area network is just a small group of computers that are connected together. The most important thing about a local area network is that those computers are close together. So your Wi-Fi at Starbucks or at a school, that is a local area network that you can only connect to if you're actually close to that. A wide area network is two local area networks that have been connected over a long distance. So maybe a school in Colorado wants to connect with a school in Missouri. They could use a wide area network. You might think that those are connected over the internet, and in the case of a virtual private network, which accomplishes basically the same thing as a wide area network, it is. VPNs use the internet to connect their two local area networks. However, a wide area network 
we'll usually rent a cable from an internet company and connect that way. So just to review, a local area network is a group of computers connected close to each other. A wide area network and a virtual private network are two local area networks or more that have been connected over long distances. The wide area network accomplishes this by renting a line from an internet company and a virtual private network does it over the internet. We're going to be talking about the internet, part one, how the internet works. To know how the internet works, we're going to talk first about IP addresses. You might be familiar with the fact that each of your devices has its own IP address, just like a house or apartment has its own actual address. The internet can't deliver data to a device unless it has an IP address. Not only does your device have an IP address, but so does the modem and the router and every step along the way in the internet, which we'll get to later. IP addresses are determined based on location, starting in five big international regions. That's on this side. As you get down the line, each of these numbers brings you to a more specific location. Now this number isn't specific enough that you could call 911, give them your IP address, and they could find your house. But it is specific enough where if you Google, find the best ice cream sandwich near me, well, Google can help you out there and actually give you something close to your location. What I want you to take away from this video is that every device that connects to the internet has an IP address and that it needs that IP address so the information knows where to go. Let's talk a little bit more about how the internet works. We've already established that every device and every other thing along the way in the internet has its own IP address. Now these IP addresses are assigned based on location. Using these IP addresses, your device can talk to your modem, which you probably have in your home, then to a router, which is set up by your web service. The router would go to the domain name server. This is still just sending a request. Now that domain name server would send back the information that was asked for, and it would go right back to your device. Now you might think this is pretty fallible. If one of these steps goes out, the whole process is done. But Really, there's so many more connections with so many routers and so many servers that if one huge chunk of the internet goes out, that still won't really affect the functionality of anything else. There are just infinite connections. It's amazing. Now what I want you to take away from this video is that your device, since it has its own IP address, can send out a request for information. That information is sent back to your device. The way it gets to your device is because of the IP address, and the way it gets there is through all the lines of the modems and routers and servers that make up the internet. We are going to talk about something called a CDN, a Content Delivery Network. Now the concept of a CDN isn't that hard to wrap your head around. What a CDN does is make a faster and smoother user experience by delivering content to the user faster. It doesn't have to go through all the channels of the internet. It creates a faster and more direct route from the site to the user. When I first was learning about CDNs, I got really confused because I thought, well, doesn't everybody benefit from that? Who's paying for the service? Is that the user that will pay for a CDN to make their internet faster? Or is that the website that pays a CDN to deliver their content? And it's the latter. A CDN is hired by a website, or in some cases developed by a website. It's its own CDN. Then that CDN pays an internet service provider to help determine the fastest routes. Now, what you need to know about CDNs in the big picture is they are hired by sites or created by sites to make the user experience faster. An example of a CDN that you should know about as a developer is how Google hosts languages like jQuery. If you, if you link to jQuery from Google's library instead of uploading it yourself to your site, that's going to be way faster for your user. Additionally, if another site has used that same CDN for jQuery, it might be stored in that user's browser so it doesn't even have to load again at all. As a user, you need to know that CDNs are everywhere. You probably use CDNs all the time without really even needing to be aware of it. As a developer, it's important for things like the languages that are hosted on Google libraries. You can use those in your sites and create a much faster user experience with less work on your end than before. 
as a big company, you might need a CDN to do something specifically for you. You might want your site to be on the fast track to your users, and you might need a CDN to do that. All I want you to take away from this video is that CDNs are content delivery networks. They are all over the place, and they make a faster user experience. We're going to talk about analog versus digital on a really basic level. Most specifically, we're going to talk about how computers interpret an analog sound and turn it into a digital file. An analog sound wave would look something like this. This would be like a perfect sine wave, which would not really ever be heard in nature, but that's beside the point. This analog sound wave, the computer takes that and measures at all these different points, measures those and turns those into numbers based on this point right here. So we could go up and say, oh, this is 0.27, and this is 0.016, and this is negative 1.2. Later, the computer could take those numbers and reinterpret them and turn them into actual sound again. We're also going to discuss a little bit of data compression, how computers compress data that is in a sound file, an image file, or a video file. Now the benefit of compression is that it's a smaller file, so it's easier to store, it takes up less space, and it's easier to send to somebody else. One of the ways this is done in sound is it would take it less often. The sampling would be every two or every three. Another way is that it would just go up to here and say, okay, this is 0.27, well, we're just going to measure everything from here. So it's negative three, negative two, negative one from there, if everything was around that same area. In images, this is done by taking the little tiniest possible pixels and just measuring it in groups of 16 and finding kind of the average color of that. The most important thing to take away from this video is you're going to want to use digital files, they're going to have a better quality, and when you're looking at compression, you really need to look at how far you're willing to go to ensure that the user still has the best experience. We are going to talk a little bit more about routers and how they relate to networking. Routers are the things that connect different small area networks. Uh, I want to give kind of a metaphor for this. So I'm a teacher. I work at a school. Let's say I have a package that I need to get to somebody that works in the district offices. I don't know where her office is exactly, but I know her name. I go to my secretary. That would be, this is me, this is my secretary. I go to my secretary. I say, hey, I need to get this to so-and-so at the district office. Can you please help me out here? She'll say, oh, sure. I don't know exactly where her office is either, but I know how to get there. I know the next step. So, even though I didn't know the next step, she does. So she goes on and sends it on to the secretary of the district office. Now, that district office secretary has no idea who I am or where I am, but she knows the end location. What I'm trying to get across here is each router only has to know its own little network, only the stops right next to it. It doesn't have to know the whole internet, just has to know its own connections. And it can take information and say, all right, I don't know exactly where that's going, but I'll pass it on to the right direction. And that's really all it takes. Routers can be different sizes, different capacities, but what they do is just know their own neighborhood, take the information, and pass it on in the right direction. Another really powerful thing that we're going to get into a little bit later is they don't have to have the full package of information either. If this computer is trying to send information all the way up here, it might get split up and go to two different routers, and that's okay. The computers are still going to know how to put that information back together correctly. Now the little pieces of information that are sent are called packets. Packets are actually little pieces of binary code, which I'm going to draw up here for you. Alright, so this is an example of what a packet might look like. It's just this line that goes up and then down and up and down and is either up or it's down. Uh, that is an electrical current, so a computer gets that and can translate that into ones and zeros, which we all know is a binary code. The way it does that is it draws lines a certain distance apart, basically, and if it's up high, it's a one, if it's down low, it's a zero. As we discussed in previous videos, this one and zero business can really mean a whole lot more. In fact, it means everything. Everything can be translated into ones and zeros, so this is really powerful. Now, these little packets are sent across through these routers, and sometimes if there's a file that's too large for one packet, it can be broken up into frames or smaller little packets. These packets don't have to go the same route. They go whichever route's available, whichever's fastest, and since they have the end IP address encoded into them, all the routers know where to send them. When they get to the end destination, that computer knows how to put it all together.